On June 9th, uh, we did an event, our first uh, attempt at doing a coalition across Canada, which we had from uh, Prince Edward Island, right? Yeah, we had uh, people from PEI, uh, to Brunswick, all the way out to British Columbia, uh, people across Ontario. Uh, my call here was uh, for a day of absence from school because I believe that uh, parents standing up and keeping their kids home was one of the only ways left to, uh, to speak back and to push back against uh, what's going on in Canada. And that came, um, uh, this, this video I shot on May 19th, uh, about an hour after I read the Supreme Court decision uh, regarding Barry Newfeld, the BC uh, Chilliwack School Trustee, who um, basically the Supreme Court of Canada has said that in the interest of protecting uh, marginalized uh, minorities like trans children, that uh, institutions of the government can abuse citizens to no end. That's the summary of the Supreme Court decision. So when school boards call us names, when unions call us names, uh, that's protected by the Supreme Court now. They're allowed to do that. Same thing with the media. In the interest of protecting uh, uh, these marginalized children, uh, we can be uh, we can be defamed and call names all, all, all the list of names, and, and you can't really sue because uh, that's not definition uh, defamation. It's in the interest of, of protecting so-called trans children. Um, so this was my reaction, um, and it's pretty raw. And uh, I guess I maybe took some cues unconsciously from Scott. Uh, and I, I'm screaming louder here, so let's, it was longer than this, and some of you may have seen it, but uh, this is, uh, uh, well, I don't know where, where uh, Elton sliced it, but let's, let's give it a go. Who stands up against this gets destroyed. Today, a Supreme Court decision came down in the case of Barry Newfeld versus Glenn Hansman. Barry Newfeld is a courageous, loving man. <coughs> Spent 30 years in youth corrections in British Columbia and saw every imaginable family dysfunction and atrocity. <coughs> he understood and understands patterns of sexual abuse and how predators operate because he wrote sentencing recommendations. And he worked with, with people on parole and he saw how these predators operate by breaking down the boundaries of, of, of safety that we teach children to protect themselves against predators. And he expressed a concern about SOGI, the curriculum imposed in British Columbia, in his capacity as a school trustee to say, in my experience, this looks like a pattern of grooming, of breaking down those boundaries that protect children from sexual predators. There's something wrong with this curriculum. And in response, the head of the BC Teachers Union, Glenn Hansman, defamed him in the public sphere, in the media, calling him a, uh, insinuating he was a predator, that he was dangerous to children, that he was a bigot and a foe, all the usual shit. Today, the Supreme Court had released this decision giving credence to Glenn Hansman as the, as the protector of the underdogs, defending the, the secret keeping and the indoctrination processes happening in school and silencing legitimate criticism of this despicable ideology. We're fucked. <laughs> This is a state-sanctioned religion that can't be criticized. At every level, every concerned, rational human being who says, wait a second, I'm sorry, this thing about being born in the wrong body doesn't seem to make sense. And when you look at the medical literature that's coming out and, and the clear evidence that, that this process of social transition and medicalizing children does not help. It harms. It doesn't help. Affirming these kids doesn't help. Medicalizing them doesn't help.
All right, so um, I'm dad. I'm a dad unit to four kids. I have two biological kids and I have two stepkids, and they're all adults now. Okay. Um, I am like Melanie. Uh, I am a trained researcher. In fact, I'm a financial analyst, but I was trained in statistical uh, research methods, uh, methodologies in the humanities when I was in university. And I know how to read a medical paper and a psychological paper and, uh, and, and various research for credibility. Uh, and there's an awful lot of bad science out there. In fact, I think science is broken. And uh, in 20, well, was six years ago, my daughter had just turned 14. She was in a Catholic school in Ottawa. And uh, she was raised between two homes, 50-50. I'm a loving dad, and we created rituals and, and family ceremony, and I did everything I could. In fact, I have a decade of journals where every for every two-week cycle, I had a heading in my journal, maker of memories, because uh, I want to be a good dad. And she came to me when she turned 14, and in Ontario, when you're 14, the courts aren't going to intercede if a child says, I want to live with my other parent. It's just kind of the kid gets to decide. And she came to me with a script. It felt very clearly like a script. And she said, I can't live in this house anymore because I'm unsafe. And I can't be who I am. And I can't express myself. And, and um, she gave me a bunch of other script. But it was very clearly can. And it came out of nowhere. It was after Easter weekend. Uh, you can maybe jump a slide or two. Uh, jump one more, and then we'll go back. I'm going to talk about rapid onset chamber dysphoria, which I believe is a psychic contagion. People call it a social contagion. Uh, my daughter, very typical, uh, trait typical female, little girl. Uh, she put a sharpie on her face because she wanted to put on makeup like her mom. Uh, <laughs> that was a great day. And then I went on a business trip and I got her a child's makeup. You can see the little picture below. And she was just thrilled she could put makeup on all by herself. Pink bedroom and uh, frilly tutus and everything that a typical, uh, beautiful girl would do. And uh, uh, let, let's go back just uh, one slide here. Um, so I had to work for nine months to get my daughter back into my life because this cult, whether it was online, and, and every indication seems to me now that this was alienation by the school, uh, partially if not wholly, uh, that they affirmed her gender questioning uh, at a new school. And uh, changed names and pronouns, and one of the people influencing my daughter is a woman who now uh, claims to be a man, uh, whose birth name is Amanda Jante Knox. And Amanda Jate Knox wrote a book called Love Lives Here after her husband, an autodynophile, uh, transitioned. And her son, who was 10 or 11 years old, also transitioned. She put him on puberty blockers. She has now uh, transitioned herself. She calls herself Rowan Knox. And she's got a new book out, conveniently timed with her uh, a new gender. And uh, with her 100,000 or so followers on various media platforms, love bombed my daughter when she changed her pronoun pronouns. Okay? This is what happens to kids. And they're told to cut people out of their lives who ask any questions. And I ask lots of questions because I'm a trained researcher and I'd already had this bug in my ear um, and, and I started reading and reading and reading and reading and I came across the work of someone called Dr. Lisa Littman. Uh, and, uh, and the work of an organization called GenSpec and some organizations in Canada. And uh, these, are, these slides are kind of jumbled, but I, I formed an organization called the Adolescent Peer uh, Influence and Social Contagion Research um, Foundation. And we raised money to engage in a, a leading artificial Canadian company, artificial intelligence company, to try and track this social contagion online because uh, at that point in my thinking, this is really the vector of, of how these kids are picking up on this, and, and it is indeed a vector. Um, now, uh, I'm going to read you something, because I'm going to be talking about psychic contagion here. Uh, and this is from the psychologist Carl Jung, and he, he wrote a book uh, that was published in 1958 called The Undiscovered Self. And if you know anything about Carl Jung, uh, Jordan Peterson talks about him an awful lot. 
he wrote prolifically and, and knew and very thickly. It's, a, it's a very dense to read, but this particular book is small. Uh, it's only a hundred or so pages, and it's not actually about the undiscovered self, it's about the individual's relationship with the group, with society. And he was writing about the mass psychosis uh, and, and the forms of mass psychosis that had occurred prior to and during the Second World War. And there was a, a bunch of literature around that time, in, uh, I think it was 1948, uh, was it 48? Orwell published 1984, or something to that effect. There was a field called General Semantics, which was uh, trying to understand the language games that were being played through the 30s to manipulate people. Um, and, and we had, early 30s, we had uh, uh, these um, standoffs between groups in the streets of Germany, between the communists and the fascists. And they were, you know, clubbing each other and setting things on fire and confronting each other. I don't know if that sounds familiar. You know, people yeah. dressed in black, covering their faces and, and, uh, and calling each other names and, and assembling in groups. Okay. So, um, I, I, I've done some research and a lot of thinking about social contagion. And this is what Carl Jung had to say in The Undiscovered Self. This is uh, chapter one. We have no reason to take this threat lightly. Everywhere in the West, there are subversive minorities who, sheltered by our humanitarianism and our sense of justice, hold the incendiary torches ready, with nothing to stop the spread of their ideas except the critical reason of a single, fairly intelligent, mentally stable stratum of the population, a small stratum, a small group of people. Rational arguments can be conducted with some prospect of success only so long as the emotionality of a given situation does not exceed a certain degree. If the affective temperature, that means the emotional level, rises above that, uh, the possibility of reason having any effect ceases and its place is taken by slogans, chimerical wish fantasies, and that is to say a sort of collective possession results which rapidly devolves into a psychic epidemic. <clears throat> Possession is not an accidental word. Um, I'm not a religious person. I have tremendous respect for people of faith, of all faiths. I'm a believer in God, the God of us all, of all people. Um, and, and the word evil is, is really the only word that I can arrive at yep. to describe what's happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is part of a long essay about the psychic contagion of, uh, of gender ideology uh, that, I, that I wrote for the APIS Substack. And uh, we are currently, um, we have the largest online samples of trans-identified men and trans-identified women in the world. And uh, just in the last couple of weeks, it's taken us a year to get to this point of research. Um, we have decided to hone in on the relationship between this social contagion and people who are also in those cohorts identified as autistic. And the people who are transitioning and have transitioned, we know from the UK, more than half of them have moderate to severe autism. They become obsessed with this concept of gender and they ruminate and they, be, they get affirmed and they end up in the gender clinic and there's no assessments done and they're just, they're, they're chemically castrated. And, uh, and sex changed. So how about we pop on a couple of slides there. Uh, ROGD, the Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria, that that's, comes out of nowhere. Um, and there's a, n a number of different patterns, and I think Scott will probably touch on the, some of the different types of, of uh, trans presentations. The autogynophile was the, one of them, which is a sexual fetish, typically of men. But in the last decade or 15 years, the, the sex ratios have flipped. So more people who are female, born female, are identifying as transgender. Uh, and it's like an 80% of the, of the number of, of people doing this. So my, my daughter is a, a victim of this cult. Uh, that's, that's, this is the only text uh, page. So this is from uh, Trans Youth Canada. And someone asked a question about where the money's coming from. So August of last year, the Trudeau government announced $100 million over five years to advance the cause of LGBTQ plus rights in Canada. Add the two S in front is this part of the agenda and there's a bunch of organizations that are sucking up. It's like a reality TV show competing for $20 million a year. Who can present the biggest victim story to suck up the most money from the government? 
Now, 2016, we can see by the graph that, that there's about 1,050 kids documented by Trans Youth Can going to gender clinics in Canada. But that's an exponential growth curve. It's growing at 80% per year. And what that means is, if you follow that curve, that in 2023, there are 10,000 children presenting to gender clinics in Canada. Less than 50% of those kids get a mental health evaluation before they're prescribed puberty blockers or hormone therapy on a first appointment in most cases. There's a clinic in London, Ontario that's prescribing puberty blockers which are devastating to the body before a child even sees the gender clinic. Um, What's the name of it? I don't know the name of the clinic. Uh, the information's available online. I think I documented it in one of my um, Wolf Watch articles, but it's easily um, resourced. We'll jump to the next slide. This is some of the early uh, data that we got. So we uh, did two major samples, population samples, with using the AI. The AI's name is Miley. Miley is the Norse god of travelers, and I use this analogy um, for, for purposes of conveying objectivity. I believe that, that there's a distinction between a tourist and a traveler. A tourist goes somewhere to see what they want to see, and the traveler goes somewhere to see what's there. And so we deployed this mathematical algorithm into social media in Canada and the United States to find out what the conversation was happening around gender dysphoria. Uh, and gender dysphoria conversation was nothing in 2015, and then we had massive spikes in, in, uh, in related content around this bucket, around the subject online in, uh, in 2022. Um, now the stuff we're getting, uh, We'll be able to publish and peer review academically on the autism work. Uh, I am working with Dr. Lisa Littman. Uh, she's consulting to our project. Uh, Dr. Lisa Marciano, who is a co-founder of GEDA, that's Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, is also a consultant. Jane Wheeler, who is the founder of RIME, which is Rethink Identity, Medicine, Ethics in the United States, and a number of other people who I can't name because they operate below, you know, they're, they're out of camera, let's say. But we have a tremendous board of advisors who are supporting us. I'll name Aaron Kimberly, who's also an advisor, and Aaron Terrell has consulted to us, um, and a number of other people who have given us input in how to ask the questions to give Miley the assignment to go into these digital spaces. Um, well, let's go on to the next. Okay, so two figures here. One, Vaclav Havel, who became the president of Czechoslovakia. Uh, after the Cold War, and this is a tremendous book if you haven't read it, The Power of the Powerless. And if you haven't read it, you probably know about it, because Vaclav Havel is a very simple book. He wrote it in a short period of time. Tells the story of a greengrocer in, in uh, it's a Prague, and all the industry was owned by the state, and so the greengrocer gets the onions and the potatoes and the you know uh, leeks, and he's putting them in the store window, and along with the shipment of groceries, he gets a sign. It's a flag he puts in the window, and the flag says, Workers of the World Unite. And everybody in Czechoslovakia at the time, who is a good party member, puts up the flag in their window, or wears it on their shirt, or has stickers on their cars, or on their books at school, and on the doors and on the, on the blackboards. Now, um, Jordan Peterson has been talking a little bit about this because he studied totalitarianism. And Vaclav Havel was talking about the totalitarian state. Peterson said, and it said several times this year, but I heard him say it uh, when I saw him in person in February in Toronto, that people think a totalitarian state is a place where you have a single dictator leader who controls absolutely everything with, by sheer uh, force and coercion. But in fact, a totalitarian state is a state where everybody lies about everything, absolutely everything, absolutely all of the time. And no one is allowed to speak the truth. No one is allowed to say, this sign is meaningless, it's propaganda. This flag that gets hung in the window, it's a virtue signal, it's a lie. And we get from, from Vaclav Havel's book, the idea of the big lie. And we've heard that phrase in the last couple of years. And, and gender ideology actually is only one of several big lies in Canada at the moment yeah. that no one is allowed to question, okay? And we get to a point further in the book where Vaclav Havel says, well, what happens one day when the greengrocer decides that he's no longer gonna put the sign in the window 
that he's no longer going to participate in the lie, that he's going to live in the truth. What happens? And in fact, he answered his own question. They had something called uh, Prop 17, if I remember correctly. Uh, maybe it's something like the September principles that we're signing off on tonight. And incidentally, I'll be signing as the director of APIS Digital Research onto those principles. Very proudly, as a matter of fact. There's our flag. The big lie. So, uh, in the course of this work with APIS Digital Research, I had a tremendous opportunity to speak with Dr. Nicholas Christakis from Yale. And he wrote a book called Apollo's Arrow. Uh, you may have seen him during the pandemic. He was a talking head on all the major US media. He's a professor, what are they, what's his title? He is Sterling Professor of Sociology at Yale, and, they, and he's a medical doctor, and he's the world's leading expert on social contagion. And through his career, he had studied pandemics through European history and the world history, as a matter of fact. And he had identified as a sociologist three major patterns or three major stages of a pandemic that contribute to, well, uh, kind of where we are right now. So in his book, Apollo's Arrow, he explains that in stage one of the pandemic, that's the disease itself. It is the uncertainty that we have, it's the mortality in the, in the through the black plagues, it was dealing with the corpses and, and you know, you know, 30, 40, 50% of, of some places were wiped out by, by disease. And, uh, and then how that, um, you know, sort of reverberates through society while the disease is ravaging people. But there's a second stage that he described, um, and that's the stage that we're still in right now. And it's driven by fear and anxiety. And it's characterized by othering the unclean, the anti-vaxxed, the Jews, the gypsies, the travelers, the poor people, the rich people. Through European history, in these second phases of a pandemic, human beings tore other human beings apart in the town square. They burned them as witches. They hunted them as heretics. And um, we, have, we have weapons of destruction at our disposal. They're digital. They're, they're weapons of character assassination and character destruction and career destruction and reputational sabotage. Jordan Peterson calls this the uh, fe female trait typical aggression or something in that order. You know, when men get aggressive, and that small percentage of aggressive men, we beat the crap out of people. Like men are you're like physically abusive. But when that small percentage of women who are uh, aggressive and abusive, or people who act out those trait typical behaviors, that it's social and reputational destruction tools that they use. And, and that's kind of where we are right now. And when our prime minister goes off and starts calling people names, what are we gonna do with those people? That's what's happening. But the same thing is happening because, you know, in, in those periods of time, what we're, what we're experiencing is a mass psychosis. It's that thing that Carl Jung talked about that's driven by anxiety and that othering process and a, a disconnection from rationality completely and an embracement uh, of sloganeering and chimerical wish fantasies. I don't know what that means actually, chimerical wish fantasy. It's, it's, an idea, it's an ideology, an ideal state of the world, I think. Now, uh, you might recognize a couple of figures here. <laughs> on, on your right is my very good friend, Chanel Fall. Um, Chanel Fall um, was, uh, was investigated for criticizing, uh, and, and here's, this is one of the big lies, right, um, of, of anti-racism, uh, BLM. Um, she criticized teachers in a private Facebook group who were promoting the idea of systemic racism and systemic injustice and, and you know, the communist ideology of Black Lives Matter or Bill Large Mansons or whatever it is. Um, and she's still under investigation. It seems like a series of, of, of things that she's facing. And of course, Billboard Chris uh, in the middle. This was October, uh, around October 20th, uh, two years ago. So coming up. Now, we were walking, this is a CBC fit footage. We were walking into the Rainbow um, Mob. And the Rainbow Mob was whipped up by uh, Catherine McKenney who was a municipal councillor in Ottawa who ran for mayor, uh, a they-them. Um, 
and Joel Harden, the minister uh, at MPP. NDP, MPP. NDP, MPP. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the Ottawa School Board, who condemned uh, hatred and bigotry by sending an email to all the parents of 72,000 children. And, uh, and we were mobbed by it. It was 300 on three. Um, and I, I believe that was a moment, um, a defining moment for Chris Elston. It certainly was a defining moment for me. That was in Broadview and Carling Avenue in Ottawa. And if that address or that location sounds familiar to you, that's where Billboard Chris went on June the 9th this year with Josh Alexander, where I met my lovely friend, Melanie and <laughs> Pierre. <laughs> and a whole bunch of other amazing people. And on that day, we went toe to toe to them, uh, about 500 aside. And, and we laugh, right? But this is stuff that was going on in Germany in the 30s, where, where, where groups of people were trying to, uh, you know, like, because they couldn't communicate and everyone was othering everybody else, were fighting against each other, uh, much more viciously than we were, you know? The, fortunately, the drones and the police and the, and, and the way that they'd set things up made it so that the, the, the risk of violence, I think, was low. And I was going to talk about the um, corruption in school boards tonight, but after yesterday, because I had the picture up a bit earlier, let's, let's see where we're going. Oh, yeah. That was a year ago. Um, I ran against, uh, I ran for school trustee, which I think uh, we need to plan for for three years from now. Yeah, we need to find all the right candidates, we need to develop our grassroots. <laughs> willing to stand up and we need to sign on with them um, so that we can replace these woke uh, these woke boards and we can take back our schools. Uh, that's the message I gave yesterday when I spoke on Parliament Hill. Let's jump, see if we jump forward. I don't know what's the next slide. There we are. Um, we outnumbered them by 8 to 10 to 1. Yeah. <laughs> they marched down the road. They marched down the road. Uh, and, and they were on the sidewalk on the other side of Wellington and the police kept them cordoned off for their own safety and they kept the two lanes between us and them. And, uh, and, and as they were marching, there were just crowds and crowds more people joining us on Parliament Hill and, uh, and, and, and filling up the space. And you can see there that density of people was also on the other side of the barrier up on the lawn of Parliament near the Eternal Flame. And it took 16 minutes for that crowd to go through the pedestrian gate near the, uh, the National War Memorial to get onto Elgin Street for the march. 16 minutes for that group of people to march through that gate. We were six blocks long from curb to curb on our march. Uh, it's hard to estimate crowd size. Somebody said 10,000. It may have been five or six. I don't know. I, I could not have had a, a more fulfilling day after standing up. Now, like, what, what, I go, go back to Vaclav Havel, because he said that, you know, what happens when people uh, decide to live in the truth? Well, they're gonna, they're gonna stop voting in the fake elections, they're gonna stop participating in the slogans, they're gonna stop hanging the signs in the window, and they're gonna meet in restaurants, and they're gonna listen to people giving presentations about living in the truth, and speaking the truth. <laughs> I, uh, I believe this will pass. Uh, Melanie, and, Melanie and I have talked, and she's, you know, what, what we've, uh, lots of people have had this conversation. Where does this go? Like, I, um, at one point a year ago, I had set myself up to pack the vehicle and to be able to be out of town in 30 minutes. I had backup cans of gas, I had three weeks worth of food, I had couple of locations I could flee to because I was getting death threats. I had my house uh, and my vehicle posted online. I had, there were Twitter accounts that were saying, the name of the Twitter account was, we're coming for you, Shannon. Uh, and these people don't have power anymore. No. <laughs> they don't have power anymore. I, my favorite video yesterday I took, I rode my bike because I live close to downtown <laughs> Ottawa. And I, I wish I could queue it up quickly. Uh, uh, I, I rode past the Supreme Court where these uh, Horizon Ottawa, these radical social justice people were uh, assembling. And I know the characters and they know me. 
And so I set up my uh, camera and I was, uh, I was rolling by riding my bike with one hand and the guy who's head of Horizon Auto, his name is Sam Hirsch. Uh, and I said, good morning, Sam. And I expected him to say, good morning, Ralph. Uh, but instead he said, pardon, my, pardon me. Fuck you, Shannon, you. <laughs> I mean, there was a string there, and it actually felt kind of good. <laughs> because I know that we're getting somewhere, right? We're staring them down, and you know, they brought their same numbers that they bring to school board meetings when we try and talk about the, the uh, you know, co-ed bathrooms and self-declaration and boys who are competing in, in girls sports and taking their trophies away from them and making them feel self-conscious and uh, in, in the change rooms and, and stealing their uh, scholarships, right, all on self-identification. They know now that when we light up our phone trees and our email chains that we can have 10 times the number of people to do the same things that they're doing to us. And, and this is how we get through this. We speak the truth, we stand up together, and the more people that stand up, like there's a meme, right? I, I, and someone's gonna articulate or remember this better than me. One person stands up against the mob, and they get pilloried. And, and you know, my friend Chris Elson is a maverick. Um, I actually said, as I got to a certain point, a couple of years ago, like this is this is crazy. I have no idea what to do about this. But if I have to wear a sandwich board and stand on a street corner, I'll do it. Yeah. And it turned out he was already doing it. Uh, and when he came to Ottawa and I had the opportunity to go out with him, I did not wait. And when we knew that we were going to be spaced down by this mob, I said, "I'm going anyway. I will stand with you, yeah. and I will take the risk." And I'll tell you, the more people like us who take the risk. The more distributed the risk becomes. These people, when they leaked the union video last week, were saying that they were going to assemble before us, they were going to dominate the space, and they were going to demoralize us. And when we got back from that march, back up to Parliament Hill, after passing several of them on street corners, crying rainbow tears because the Nazis were coming, there were none of them left on Parliament Hill. They all took their rainbow flags and they went home. I don't know if there's another slide there. Maybe I finished off with APIS Digital Research. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the data that we're getting this year. I've told my friends, because I've I've put my professional life on hold for the last two years. I've dedicated my life full time to this for my daughter and for other kids. Um, that after the 20th, I need to go back. I've done my tour of duty. I will still talk. I will still support people and resource people, but I need to go and I need to make sure that, that I have a marriage to, to go back to. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I've got, you know, that I can maybe retire someday uh, and, and place some emphasis on my family. Uh, and maybe I'll do another tour of duty down the road. Um, my name is Shannon Boucher. Um, I'm uh, the author of, uh, and the writer of uh, the Woke Watch Canada Weekly um, blog, and now the co-host with my friend Melanie of the Woke Watch uh, sort of weekly Canadian gender wars report where we're tracking what's going on in the media in Canada around this gender issue every week and we're, we're giving it some humor and we're giving it some criticism and we're we're marking the progress because this what I shared with you today was benchmarks yeah. okay two years ago it was three people against 300 a year ago uh, I got the snot kicked out of me in in the, the press because I was running against a trans identified candidate in Ottawa who's now the chair of the board and called all kinds of names and I survived and and all there were many many people across the country doing the same thing at the same time and we have all made a difference mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm very proud to be here today and, and, uh, and, and thank God